Our next panel is on sustainability and environmental issues. Uh, our moderator today is Adam Nicholson for this panel. He is a second year SEPA fellow graduating this year, um, one of the current uh, STML certificate uh, students. And he is also, his work is in, you know, involved, his work as a graduate student involves issues of sustainability and in particular fisheries and environmental issues. So he's well suited to moderate this panel. Uh, our first, I'm gonna introduce all three panelists. So we have some continuity straight through the session and then we'll get started. So our first panelist is um, Matt Chadsey. Matt has uh, 30 years of experience helping leaders define and implement innovative solutions to multidisciplinary challenges related to the environment, healthcare and technology. He, as I know, because I've seen him do it, leverages his foundation of systems thinking today and works primarily with partners facing uh, really climate challenges such as wildfires, sea level rise. And he's, he does a lot with um, data, uh, visualization and ideas from science, technology, economics and policy. And he's really working to build more durable and resilient communities and ecosystems, which is something we appreciate that you're doing, Matt. He's also a great guy, just so you know, you can tell. Our second panelist today is Annalie Wilson. She is a sustainability analyst for Chipotle Mexican Grill. She completed her MPA at Cornell University's Brooks School of Public Policy, was one of my favorite students, of course. Concentrated her studies in international development with the focus on sustainability and supply chains. Uh, she now uh, provides her consulting services to various nonprofits in the textiles and apparels sphere and um, supports upskilling and reskilling initiatives for global textile artisans in Guatemala. So she's got quite a, a nice amount of, uh, even though she's young and a recent grad, she has a lot of experience and has the chops to prove it. Our final panelist, also one of my favorites, uh, Jess Sokolow. Uh, she is, uh, was actually part of our 2016 event, one of the student finalists and did a great presentation on the crisis in Flint, Michigan around water. She's an experienced professional and team lead. She develops, te she develops teams and individuals, drives assessment, strategy, communications, all kinds of things. She's, a, she's kind of a unique mix of consulting, startup, research and policy experience across public, private and nonprofit sectors. I think she's trying to help me lose my breath by having such a long bio. But she's really, the thing that's really cool about Jess, although there's a lot of things, is she's passionate, she's really passionate about using systems-based approaches and other innovative methods to kind of solve these interdisciplinary problems um, and seeks evidence-based solutions to things. So Jess, welcome, good to see you. I'm going to pass this to you all. And our first speaker today is going to be Matt Chatsey. So take it away. Great, thanks so much, Laura. And I'm just uh, very excited to uh, follow the last uh, panel and to um, a lot of the, what I wanna talk about is uh, climate related and a lot of the policy and, and different issues um, that come from that. So let me start my slides. You see those okay? Okay, great. Um, so I work at um, the intersection between nature and communities, helping communities build resilience to climate change. Um, and I wanna talk about how you use agent-based approach and DSRP to do this. But first I wanna give you some examples of what the risks and the type of complex adaptive systems uh, that I'm working on entail. There we go. Uh, the first, this is an overhead view of the Camp Fire in Northern California in 2018. Uh, this was the most damaging natural disaster on the planet that year and was um, unusually intense and damaging. To give you a sense, at its peak, the fire was spreading at a rate of over 80 football fields per minute. Uh, it's over 100 acres a minute. It was uh, coming down the mountain towards this community. Uh, the losses were, were devastating. Uh, over 86 folks died in the fire. Uh, over 18,000 structures were damaged and destroyed. And the overall cost of the fire was over $16 billion. And this is an example, one of many of the types of uh, challenges, complex adaptive systems 
that uh, we're dealing with with climate change. There's elements around climate ecosystems, policy, and people. And I just want to give you a flavor of, of each of those. And there's, there's many others, but just to give you a sense of, of what's included in each. Um, for something like the campfire, there's obviously the temperature and drought and the high winds, but there's also rainfall. Uh, one of the many damaging factors of a, a wildfire is uh, rainfall following the fire that causes mudslides and significant additional damage. From an ecosystem perspective, the health and resilience of the ecosystem, the diversity of the, the plants and animals in the ecosystem, and also the geographic area, how um, divided it is by uh, rural and suburban development has a big impact on how the system behaves. From a policy perspective, obviously land use and zoning, how, how people live in and around these uh, environments is very important, as is the fire suppression policy. Uh, US Forest Service has a, a limited suppression policy and other, other groups have a very high uh, suppression, trying to suppress fires very quickly. So there's lots of different policies around fire suppression itself. Um, insurance, insurance rates and policy also um, is important and uh, in terms of how this system behaves, as is the policy behind disaster recovery funding and, and how um, areas recover from these, these disasters. And from people perspective, obviously jobs, the economy, uh, people's mental and physical health, and uh, the overall quality of life of individuals in the community are all very important. So wildfire is obviously not the only type of risk that we see. Um, this is an example uh, from the US Drought Monitor looking at extreme and exceptional drought in the US facing communities, uh, farm communities and cities and, and others all throughout the Western United States that share many of the same characteristics. This is a flood in the uh, Mississippi Delta, uh, which is facing more extreme uh, flooding events, longer duration flooding events from, uh, that are caused both by a very intense rainfall uh, and also by sea level rise that's literally backing up the Mississippi River to some degree. And this is probably one of the most striking and, and interesting examples. This is a community called Ile de Jean Charles in, near Louis, in Louisiana, near New Orleans. This is, uh, a Native American community that uh, the island that they are on 50 years ago is 22,000 acres. Due to subsidence and sea level rise, it's now 300 acres. And it's the first community in the uh, United States is being formally moved because of sea level rise. And there's a $50 million grant right now to move this community uh, upland and uh, off of this diminishing island. It's a fascinating project. There's a link uh, if you look at the slides after in, in the bottom corner to, to learn more about this uh, ethically and uh, technically complex effort. So now let me talk a little bit about um, the model between nature and communities and how work that I and others are doing are trying to change this model. Historically, um, the model is very much a resource extractive model. Nature provides things like timber and drinking water and fisheries and other assets to communities. And this is the model that we're, we're trying to change. The new model is looking at nature-based solutions to help build resilience to, uh, for communities. And it really requires building from the ground up the, uh, the mental model around nature and communities. This is a picture of a nature-based solution in Rhode Island, which is a uh, restoration of sand dunes. And it turns out that natural dunes are one of the most uh, cost-effective and effective ways to uh, minimize sea level rise and storm damage from major storms like East Coast United States hurricanes. So a nature-based solution is essentially using the um, capabilities of nature um, to solve uh, and reduce risk. So now I want to just take a few minutes walking through each of the, the simple rules of DSRMP and show how I've applied these and how they, they apply in these in various policy um, and complex adaptive systems. The first, and I think is probably the most interesting, getting to what Derek said about the importance of looking at distinctions, is what a solution actually is. And to all sorts of risks over the years, uh, in this case, flood control, Solutions are typically highly engineered. They're made of concrete. 
they're usually overbuilt for the worst case, uh, so extremely expensive. And they're often isolated from communities in nature. And in this case, literally divide the community in half. Uh, this is examples, the LA River in Los Angeles. The new distinction of what a solution is, a nature-based solution, um, is something that's integrated with nature. It's resilient to many different conditions. It has holistic benefits, like uh, in this case, uh, habitat for animals, bird watching for local people, carbon capture, all sorts of different things that can come from this benefit or from this uh, nature-based flood management solution. And it's also integrated with the community. The community members help to build it. Uh, they care about it and they care for it. This is Meadowbrook Pond in Seattle, Washington. Uh, near where I live. So the next rule is looking at part whole systems. And uh, this is a good follow on to the previous conversation, benefit cost analysis. Uh, we like to say benefit cost, so the benefit is it's above one if it's, uh, if it's positive rather than CBA. But the old view of benefit cost analysis is very simple and narrow as, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, you have a single intervention. This is again, Mississippi Delta uh, building a berm to protect this house. And the, um, the benefit is that there's reduced damage theoretically to the house. So it's a very narrow and simple way to look at it. And as was mentioned, not very dynamic or reflective of the complex system that these things are occurring within. So this is a new way to look at benefit cost analysis. So I don't think we have to necessarily uh, toss it out or, or find um, you know, a total replacement, but it's called a holistic benefit cost analysis. And this is something that I've been working with communities around the country and around the world to understand is taking, this is another flood control project called Mirabu Water Garden in New Orleans. And it's um, again, a nature-based solution. It captures 10 million gallons of water during flood events, but it has all these other benefits, very broad benefits. There's recreation, sports fields, it reduces heat island effects, uh, captures carbon. It's actually a tourist site because as, as people go and, and visit, uh, and see what's been done there. Uh, also helps with mental and physical health for community members who live near and can walk through. Um, and longevity, it lasts for a very, very long time, much longer than a concrete wall would. Um, so this is a new mindset and a new way to, I guess, both a distinction and looking at new parts of a, a benefit cost analysis. And this is something that's being adopted now uh, more and more by uh, groups like FEMA, um, the Federal Emergency management organization. So the next is looking at relationships. So nature-based solutions, again, getting away from the old traditional relationship of the uh, resource supplier to communities and looking much more at a synergistic type of relationship. So nature-based solutions support the community, support the economy, help make a more resilient community and a healthy community in turn um, supports the nature-based solution. And then finally, the most uh, interesting is perspectives. Uh, Nature-based solutions, there's many, many perspectives on it. And um, from everything from engineers and economists, they feel sort of unpredictable. It doesn't really meet how they've done things for a long time. It's a lot more complicated to look at the flood uh, or the wave reduction benefit of a, um, a restored sand dune than it is a concrete wall but that doesn't mean the, kind of the sand dune isn't more effective and, and less expensive. Um, agencies and funders feel like it's um, kind of new and it's moving fast and they're trying to, to kept, keep up. Um, and then the public and NGOs see it as a huge opportunity to, to meet lots of different goals um, and to uh, both provide better uh, assets, amenity for the community, but also meet things like equity and environmental equity for the community or habitat for animals that the NGOs are working specifically on. So a lot of the work is both filling gaps in the models of all these different folks and also understanding their, their perspectives. So in the end of the day, we, we hopefully have, and this is again, working its way well, I think around the world at this point, a new model that where the nature-based solution supports the community well-being and vice versa. And then they both help to mitigate climate risk. So with that, um, that I'm, I would love to, I could talk for hours about this stuff. So if anybody's interested, I'd, I'd love to uh, follow up later in the question section. But for now, I'll uh, hand it over to Anna Lee to talk about the textile supply chain.
So thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for that, Matt. That was really great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All righty, can everybody see it okay? Great, all right. So hi everyone, I'm Annalie Wilson. I'm so grateful to be a part of this Systems Thinking Conference and I thank you for taking the time to join our sustainability panel. So today I will be sharing my ABA analysis of the global apparel supply chain system and how I use various system thinking analyses such as DSRP, Posewit, and CAS to understand, define, and make comparisons of the current system structure to an aspirant one. So through this analysis, I was able to create behavioral recommendations for the systems agents to establish a new system structure uh, that limits the negative externality, externalities output by the current system. So this new or aspirant system structure is better known as a circular economy model. So let's dive into what this all means and how it looks in a real world example. So to explain the apparel supply chain system, I'm going to use the example of a cotton t-shirt. So the supply chain system begins with the cotton crop, which is then spun into yarn and knit into fabric. That fabric can be dyed or treated before it's sent to be cut and sewed into a finished garment. That finished garment is then sent to a retailer uh, to be sold to the customer. And then at that point, what the customer does with that garment after they're done with it, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so first, we're going to discuss how to use DSRP to understand the current system. Um, and I was able to make distinctions of multiple part whole systems within the supply chain system itself. So for example, these can include the yarn spinning system, the fabric knitting system and so forth. And I also determined that the relationships of those systems are very linear. So they're moving in one direction, starting at the farm and ending in landfill. So I also was able to derive uh, the main perspectives of the system, um, which are the US government, non-governmental organizations and international governments. And these distinctions are able to regulate and maintain accountability throughout the supply chain. And additionally, through conducting a CAS analysis of the system, I was also able to determine that these distinctions and perspectives are also the agents of the system. So they are carrying out the purpose of the system or the positive. Um, and now this is where things can get tricky. Going back to what uh, I said happens once a consumer is done with their t-shirt, um, we have to look at a positive analysis to determine what the purpose of the current system is through understanding what it does. And it doesn't look all that great. So the current system structure, once a consumer is finished with that t-shirt, for one reason or another, that garment will most likely end up in a landfill. So according to the EPA, in 2018 alone, 17 million tons of textile waste was produced. And of that, 73% ended up in landfills. So without uh, those textiles being recycled, composted, donated, or combusted for energy recovery, that's a lot of waste. Um, and while donation may seem like a good solution, it's important to note that this simply just increases the life cycle of a garment uh, by a few years, and it doesn't entirely solve our issue with this landfill. Uh, you also might think about recycling, um, but the current recycling infrastructure that's set in place for textiles, um, it really only can uh, recycle 1% of clothing into new, uh, new clothing. So, and that's according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So uh, the most likely destination for that t-shirt is a landfill. And the landfill is not the only issue or negative outcome of the current system. Uh, the, the current system structure and its agents encourage an overconsumptive culture uh, of its consumers, creating a push from producers to cut corners to meet demand. And this leads to a plethora of environmental and social issues, such as environmental and climate impacts, labor and pollution driven human rights violations and the depletion of non-renewable resources, which uh, the industry consumes 98 million tons of annually. So what are we gonna do about it? Uh, we understand that the current system just it has undesirable outcomes. So how do we address that? My solution is to reimagine how the system is structured altogether. With this shift, we can aspire towards a future positive that addresses these negative outcomes. With the ABA approach and the circular economy model, I have made recommendations for the agents of the current system. 
So these recommendations and system changes are to support a shift from a linear system structure to a circular closed loop system where outputs are becoming inputs. And let's look at the system's aspirant future purpose or POSWID. So in the future, it aims to positively impact social and environmental outcomes across the globe by addressing the root differences between the current and future POSWID. Uh, these include a lack of US government accountability, lack of coordination throughout the supply chain, and lack of action by global governments. So how do we do this? How do we turn inputs and outputs? How do we improve this uh, system and in improve its out uh, outcomes? So let's start by defining the recommended simple rules of the agents for the system. Um, these include collaboration, feedback, education, and innovation in its simplest sense. So through following these simple rules, the agents can change the system behavior to reach it desi its desired purpose of improving its outcomes. So starting with co uh, collaboration and feedback, uh, this can be defined through establishing feedback and collaboration, not only between all of the agents of the system, but also between the agents of the system and the perspectives themselves. So this means that, that there is feedback and collaboration throughout the members of the supply chain, as well as among US governments, international governments, and NGOs. So this could look like establishing a multi-stakeholder initiative to address, to address various social and environmental issues throughout the supply chain. Another example would be infrastructure capacity building through the collaboration of the US government and post-consumer waste facilities to establish a more robust recycling program. And next, recommendations around education and innovation. Um, and we're looking for ways to improve the system through adopting new technologies and practices that support and carry out sustainability initiatives. So these can be utilizing transparency technology, so RFID technology, to increase traceability and accountability throughout the system. It can also look like the supply chain uh, producers adopting sustainable manufacturing uh, practices, such as encouraging a virgin synthetic fiber producer to add machinery that can recycle old clothes into new ones. And that will help us address that 98 million tons of non-renewable resources that are consumed each year. So these recommendations can be made throughout the system, but the greatest field of influence is in uh, closing this loop right here between the post-consumer waste system and fiber producers. So to give a little bit more detail on what these recommendations for the mismatch look like within a mental model, here's a snapshot of my Plectica map. This takes the components of the current system structure and connects them together via my behavioral recommendations, which are noted in red. So through the implementation of these recommendations, we can create a new circular system structure to close the loop and remove the need for landfill. So in summation, through ABA analysis, I was able to take an unsustainable linear structure and change it through behavioral recommendations for the agents of the supply chain system. Um, and we were able to create a closed loop circular structure, which reduces the negative outcomes of the system. So thank you so much for letting me share my work. I really appreciate it. And I'll turn it over to Jessica. Great job, Annalie. So interesting to see. Um, so I'm taking a different perspective here. So I work with companies like Annalie's company, Chipotle, um, to advise clients on their ESG journey. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, it's Jeff Sokolow. Uh, really great to be back here at the Systems Thinking Conference. Um, I am a senior director at Framework ESG. So we are a, an advisory firm that advises companies on um, how to become more sustainable, if you will. Um, and um, many people, including my family, my friends, don't really know what I do. Uh, so I figured I'd just take us a step back and define ESG. So um, when I talk about what I do, I often take a step back and I say I do ESG consulting. So ESG consulting actually takes a look at the larger system. So when companies typically look at, you know, the success of their bottom line, their financial performance, their business, um, they, we ask them to take a step back and take additional perspectives 
um, so that we're taking into consideration the environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities. So this means that you know um, droughts will in fact impact the performance of a company if they're really dependent on that natural resource to use in their system. But also companies impact the environment as well. Obviously, we hear a lot nowadays about how companies impact their employees. Um, and so having that social impact of employee engagement, recruit recruitment and retention um, is an important impact that we also take into consideration. But I go through, I have, I don't even want to tell you how many client meetings I have a day. I go between a lot of different clients um, and I carry around these system thinking tools, system thinking, mapping and leadership um, like my backpack. Um, I work with clients across so many different industries, um, contexts, um, and there would be no way that I could work with them on their ESG journeys unless I had universal tools. Um, and so system thinking, mapping, and leadership are really those tools that I bring across all those engagements. So one client we've worked with before is Nike. Um, so let's say that Nike came to me and said, you know, I have some press or I have an investor reaching out and saying that we need to do something on this ESG front. Uh, can you help us recycle more? Um, can you help us reduce our paper use? Like, I could help you on your ESG journey, um, but let's, let's take a step back here. Um, you know, where you're gonna have the most impact may or may not be um, recycling at your corporate offices. Let's take a look at the broader value chain, the broader system at play. You know, let's map that out. Let's think about it. Um, if you take a look at this broader value chain and what we've heard of Nike, you know, back in the early 2000s, you know, we all know that human um, labor conditions, human rights is an important issue for them. And then on the other side, on Anneli's side, which she really set up for us well, is you know, the waste side, the end use of the product, right? Um, and so clearly, you know, if I'm thinking about how I'm going to impact this, how Nike is going to have more positive impacts on environment and society and reduce their negative impacts, I'm gonna think a little bit differently about the system. Now, what I start with with clients is I create a list of issues. We call it an issues list. It's part of a materiality assessment, fundamental assessment for ESG consulting. Here's a list of ESG issues. It could be vast. This can keep going and going. And as we distinguish additional E, S, and G issues. Um, but what I think of is that an ESG profile for a client is really specific. Um, it is very unique for the company, and I need to take that into consideration um, when I am um, yeah. <laughs> uh, when I am um, thinking about the company I'm working with. So the way that I do that um, is I do a perspective taking exercise. So um, when we think about Nike, they have a lot of um, stakeholders at play, right? Um, here is a selection of internal and external stakeholders at play for Nike. Um, I selected only a couple um, internal stakeholders. Uh, I think about really um, perspectives that understand the business, business risks and opportunities facing the company, um, as well as stakeholders that understand that broader ESG profile. And if I were to survey them, do interviews, focus groups, document analyses, which is what I do um, to understand those perspectives, it will really narrow me in on some key ESG issues for the company. So in this case, you see that there's a number of ESG issues that came out of this analysis. And when you're seeing a materiality analysis, you'll see it plotted on a matrix like this, um, where those issues that came out of those perspectives that are most important for the company come to the top right. And this is how we make decisions for the company. So I don't want them to boil the ocean. That is not gonna be the most effective use of their resources, their time, their energy. Um, and it's not gonna allow them to have the biggest impact. I want them to have a positive business impact. Of course, they're not going to be successful or be able to give back into the system unless they have a positive business impact but also an environmental and social impact as well. 
you see that if you distinguish these issue areas, there's a number of issues across the E, S, and G areas. Um, and they weren't related to recycling at their headquarters. Now, the way that we line it up, and where do we go from here, is that now you can see, if you go into Nike's uh, impact report from this year, all the way that they're communicating to their stakeholders is around these issue areas that came out of that perspective taking analysis. So um, people, play, planet, or how they categorize their ESG efforts. And the work that they're doing in there is directly a result of what the stakeholders said were most important to the company and to them. And not only do they communicate that way, but they also create their strategy, their performance, their management systems in the same way. You see these distinctions, representation and hiring, pay and benefits, health and safety, all of those came out of that perspective taking exercise. And they establish, if we think about systems leadership, a vision, a goal for each of those issue areas. Now, as I think about Nike on their ESG journey, this is how I think about clients, and this is how I talk through clients on their ESG journey, where I think about, okay, where do you wanna be? Now, clearly we all know, um, well, now we know that Nike is a transformational leader when it comes to ESG. Um, they are you know, up ahead of the pack, um, but they weren't always there. Um, the you know, current state, Sometimes is you know companies come to me and say I have no idea how to get started. They might not even be on this map, right? So it is my job to de develop that ESG profile, that fingerprint to say, okay, this is your current state. Now where do you want to be? You know what is that vision? And then we will take you know create a roadmap to get you there based on that perspective taking exercise. And you know, that was my one meeting for the day from Nike. So I'll go off to the next one. Uh, maybe I'll go work with Penske, a great client over there. And I will take my ESG and system thinking backpack with me um, and you know, address that next unique ESG profile. So I hope that was helpful. It gives you a little bit more context on what I do, how I use DSRP, DMCL and system mapping. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jess. That was very insightful. Um, and up next, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Just on. Okay, thank you. So first question from the audience. Uh, this is for Matt and um, question reads, so, can you talk um, about how this model can scale from small to large interventions uh, with regards to your nature-based solutions? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a great question. Um, and one of the really interesting things is it's scalable, sort of ultimately scalable. Um, it works for simple uh, neighborhood projects, street trees, uh, just thinking about the benefit for neighbors around, you know, trees in your community or something like that. And you, you can add all of the different uh, benefits and costs and uh, concepts around that. All the same sort of perspectives matter. You know, there's people who have to clean up the leaves and, you know, there's there's positive and negative perspectives of that. Um, and then I'll share, you know, at the, the high end, the largest projects uh, is fascinating. There's a project to literally divert uh, the Mississippi River. It's a billion dollar project. Um, there's actually maybe three of them ultimately. And the goal is to add nutrients back into around where I showed the map of Ile Charles and basically create new land using the sediment from Mississippi River that now just get diverts out into the, into the Gulf. Um, so all these ideas were used for that. The more holistic benefit cost analysis was used for that. Um, and the concept of, you know, basically using nature as a solution. So, it's fun because it's it's scalable, you know, all the way from the smallest to kind of unimaginably big projects. So good, good question. Awesome, thanks, Matt. Yeah, and that also you know brings up the point, you know, the time to stop fighting nature and let it let it run its course and do its thing because in the end, nature wins. 
One thing that's fascinating, uh, a lot of times in workshops, someone will come up with a picture, a photograph from 1940 and say, we, we need the river to look like this. And so basically, you know, it used to be a beautiful river through the community. Everybody loved it and played by it. Now it's a polluted, you know, um, cemented off thing. And they're trying to get back to where they were. So uh, that's a good uh, vote for nature right there. Awesome. Thanks again. Uh, our next question from the audience is for Jess. How do you go about the prioritization of exercise uh, as outlined in slides 12 and 13? Is there a particular methodology for quantification that you use? Yeah, so when we um, survey participants and interview them, we ask them to um, rank and um, rank the issues that are most important to them um, that will have, from their perspective, the greatest impact on society and environment, on the business. Um, and so that ranking goes into a quantitative back end um, where we use um, the, uh, where we pull in also the data from the qualitative analysis and also some AI analysis at times um, that gathers frequency data on how often the um, stakeholders mention the issue areas and the um, sentiment in which they issue, mention them, because right, some issues might be positive or negative impact. That's all quantified in the back end. Um, then, not to get too detailed, but then the stakeholders are weighted. So not all stakeholders, not all perspectives would you know, matter equally to a company and we work with them to weight those perspectives. And then that is what you see on the matrix. So that is quantified. And then that value that comes to the, the top is that most material issue for the company. Awesome. Thank you, Jess. And uh, next question is for Anneli. Um, within your, your model for a, a more sustainable supply chain for, um, for clothing, have you considered a, any changes to a more durable product and or changes to the consumer perception of, of clothing, as uh, i.e. making it last longer or using it a lot more? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, that's one component of why the system structure is really not, uh, I guess you'd say it's very good at producing cheap clothing that doesn't last as long. So if you look at clothing and the life cycle um, years prior, it's it's much less um, compared to what it is, or I should say much more than it is now. Um, so creating more durable products and really changing how consumers think about their clothes, that, that's a huge component of it. And, that's how um, NGOs can come into play. Um, Fashion Revolution is one really good example of how they're encouraging consumers to really take a second look at how they're consuming and how they can play a part in all of this. Awesome, thank you, Amelie. Um, okay. <clears throat> Let's see, next question. Uh, this next one's for Jess. Can you talk a little more about integrating ESG with the vision um, that you build for your clients um, into a broader vision and mission for those companies? I'd actually go the other way around. Um, and that was actually something that I wanted to, if we had, you know, another 30 minutes, um, I would love to share some slides on that, you know, so future day. Um, but it's interesting to see. Um, so a lot of companies, of course, they have their vision and mission. Um, and it won't be um, related to an ESG, um, their ESG impact at all, right? Um, to, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a company um, where it's, you know, to teach, you know, more the, well, I'm trying to think, is there any, any good, you know, VMC out vision mission that anyone comes to mind for anyone? No? Anyway, oh, um, uh, we just did one that was, a, uh, you know, Zora's was a world subscribed. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Derek. So um, and if you think about that, um, why don't we think about how we can have that uh, vision and mission line up to their environmental and social impacts as well, right? So what we help companies do is to sometimes at least line up an environmental and social vision and mission to at least be aligned to that, say, world's you know, subscribed model. Um, but 
to evolve it even further to be more transformational along that um, map I showed you at the very end, um, we can see that um, Patagonia, um, Unilever, are examples uh, who have their company vision and mission uh, actually be directly in line with their ES, where they want to go, their purpose of positively impacting their environment and negatively reducing their impact on environmental and social uh, domains. Awesome, thank you, Chess. And the next mit, or the next question is, is for the group. So, you know, we're all students of systems thinking, and uh, we're all pretty familiar with you know the different models within DSRP, ABA, and all these tools that we use. Do you all find that this is a complete tool set, or are there other aspects of other tools that you take and bring into uh, systems thinking uh, to help amplify it? I can, I guess I can start. Um, I mean, I, I would say that uh, these tools are really the elements and as Derek and Laura talk about uh, often sort of the elemental way to understand things. Um, and then there's lots of other tools, you know, even simple project management tools or data visualization or, you know, other things that can layer on top to answer specific questions or gather feedback or, um, you know, communicate certain technical topics. There's lots of sort of uh, technical frameworks that are needed, but I really look at these tools as, as the elemental understanding at the at the bottom to really, as we've talked about, you know, pretty much everybody uh, the last couple of days have talked about understanding the system first. Um, so I, I think these are really the ultimate way to to do that. And, and then there's lots and lots of specialty things that that layer on top for very specific purposes. So I would I would say that I don't know what others would say. I can kind of jump off of what you were saying. Um, so, I mean, I think that the systems thinking tools, I mean, mine with my project was very niche in nature, um, but going from fashion to food, I've learned very quickly that systems thinking can really be applied anywhere. Um, I mean, a few changes here and there, and the, the agents of the system obviously change, and they have different simple rules that they follow, but um, really understanding just in a real world example of taking something like apparel and then applying it and, and all of that I've learned from that to food, it's it's really proven that systems thinking is really versatile. For me, um, of course, there's specific um, ESG, environmental social tools, for example, materiality, right? I just they described to you the materiality process, which is a fundamental tool um, for us to guide clients, but, at the foundation of materiality is DSRP systems thinking, um, which is just, I kind of constantly find that fascinating. Um, but another tool is just the EQ skills, actually. So, um, and I am constantly talking to clients um, that have a really different context of um, ESG, of sustainability, of um, the world around them. And, and so those EQ skills allow me to um, go between those client engagements to converse with those different clients and then those different stakeholders. Um, and then also, of course, build a team of consultants that can do the same um, and apply those skills. So um, also at the, the core is uh, system thinking. Awesome, thank you. And I think I think we have time for one more question, and, and this kind of coattails off of the first question. Do these systems and these frameworks feel like a natural fit for your problems? And when you're working with clients, do they immediately have buy-in on these frameworks for systems thinking? Or does it sometimes take a little bit of a change of thought or a change of perspective uh, to get them to buy in into this type of thinking? I don't sell them on the thinking because I just use the language all the time. Um, it's sort of funny. My president of um, our company uh, came back from a conference. And he's like, I went to this fascinating conference on systems thinking. You talk just like them. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's how I think. That's how we all think. Um, so it's just I constantly or you know, I'm helping to make distinctions or what do you really mean by 
you know, um, your climate production target? What are the parts of that, right? And it's, uh, you don't really need buy-in when you um, are just using it to describe your thinking, your mental model. It's just so natural. Um, and then they start using the language as well, um, which I find fascinating. Awesome, thank you. And I, I mean, I have very limited experience with clients, but I, um, in my freelance work, um, just sharing even just positive analysis and doing uh, vision and mission statements and kind of looking at it from a perspective of, okay, like let's make this a real tool that we can utilize rather than something that sounds good. Um, and so when you frame it like that, it, it is very easy for adoption to take place. So that's something that I've really learned from utilizing systems thinking and found that clients are excited about that as well. Great, thanks. All right, with that, I think um, we're just about out of time for questions. Um, thank you all so much for your wonderful presentations and uh, they're very, we're very insightful. And I, you know, seeing this type of framework and thinking um, in the environmental side, uh, gives hope that we can make progress and um, you know leave the world or the planet better uh, than we have found it. So with that, I'll pass it back to Laura.